Good afternoon to everybody who's joining us today. My name is Sandra Begay. I serve as the chair of the UNM Rainforest Innovations Board of Directors. And it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the 2021 Virtual Innovation Awards. This ceremony is UNM RI's annual event to recognize the accomplishments of the University of New Mexico faculty, staff, and students who have received issued patents for this year for their inventions. The Innovation Awards is a reflection of the remarkable innovative and entrepreneurial spirit at UNM. Many of the technologies being recognized with a patent tonight are already optioned and licensed to companies. Some have led to the creation of new startup companies and others are being marketed for commercial opportunities. Several inventors receiving awards this year are also actively involved in startup companies. Those honored this year are our critical partners in building an innovation ecosystem in New Mexico. We admire the ingenuity and scientific rigor that it takes to create technologies that can contribute to both the common good and economic growth. These discoveries are pioneering advances in science that are also economically viable because of the collaboration and entrepreneurial spirit among UNM inventors who are helping us build the relationships that lead to commercialization. So on behalf of the UNM Rainforest Innovations Board of Directors, I would like to thank all of the inventors honored this year for their hard work, creativity, and vision. And now I would like to welcome UNM President Garnett Stokes. Thank you, Regent McGay, for that kind introduction. And it's a pleasure to speak with you this afternoon. I want to congratulate the UNM inventors gathered here today who are being recognized for receiving issued patents resulting from their scientific discoveries. This work and the commercialization outcomes that result from it are so important to the University of New Mexico and our state. All of these inventors represent a growing community of role models for new inventors and entrepreneurs who are growing our innovation economy. Our keynote speaker this afternoon is Dr. Patrick Mooney, CEO of Linnaeus Therapeutics. Patrick started off as an English major and received his BA from St. Joseph's University. Later, he decided to become a doctor, receiving his MD from the Jefferson Medical College at the Thomas Jefferson University. He's been a doctor, an investment banker, and CEO for several companies. In 2016, Patrick joined Linnaeus as their CEO. Founded in 2016, Linnaeus is a clinical stage biopharmaceutical company engaged in the identification and development of small molecule agents for the treatment of cancer. In particular, they've demonstrated that activation of the G-protein coupled estrogen receptor may be key in that fight. Their lead compound right now, LNS8801, works in tandem with the G-protein coupled estrogen receptor and has activity across a range of preclinical cancer models. This compound was granted a fast track designation by the FDA in 2020. And in clinical trials last year, they dosed their first patient with their compound in combination with Keytruda, a humanized antibody used in cancer immunotherapy. This marked the first time any company has administered such a unique recipe of compound and antibody. Linnaeus is making great strides in developing new ways in which we treat cancer. We are honored to have Patrick here with us this afternoon as our keynote speaker. And so, without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Patrick Mooney. Well, thank you, Dr. Stokes. Um, I appreciate that. And thank you to the Rainforest team, the Rainforest Innovations team for having me today. It's really, it's my privilege to be here. Um, you know, just a little bit of background. Um, you know, we at Linnaeus connected with the University of New Mexico team, Eric Prosnitz and, and Lisa and the folks at Rainforest Innovations back in 2016. And it really has been a, a fantastic collaboration really with the university. Um, you know, since its inception. We wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the University of New Mexico from the very beginning. 
you know, Eric has collaborated, Dr. Prosnitz has collaborated with us, um, you know, on research. Uh, we have an NCI grant um, that Dr. Prosnitz had been working on with us. And also the University of New Mexico Cancer Center um, has been a, a, a critical clinical trial site for our phase one um, clinical trial of the compound. Dr. Willman and all of the folks over at the Comprehensive Cancer Center, um, you know, as, as the head of the center and also <clears throat> um, uh, the team there that has been uh, involved in the study, the principal investigator, Dr. Muller, have been fantastic um, partners in our clinical trial, uh, you know, moving the compound forward. So again, I'm very pleased to be here tonight. I can't think of a better guy to get this award than Eric. Um, I'm very pleased for him and happy to be a part of the UNM ecosystem. Um, Karen, could you move to the first slide, please? The next slide. So what you see here today um, is the team. I feel like I don't need to say too much about Linnaeus, some of that great introduction um, already, but a, a, a lot of this stuff will be repeated. Um, I'm the CEO, we have a good team. Um, the team that we put together um, has allowed us to move the compound very quickly from an idea in the lab um, at the University of New Mexico and at the University of Pennsylvania and into the clinic in, in a really fast period of time. Typically that process takes many, many years and costs many, many millions of dollars. And we've had really great success moving the compound very quickly into the clinic. Um, you know, we, we really started to do that in 2018 after we raised our Series A. Um, and by 2019, we were enrolling our first patient in a phase one clinical trial in the fall of 2019. So it really was a rapid uh, 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 movement through the IND preclinical development. And that's largely because we have a great team, um, you know, a lot of big pharma expertise, um, you know, in small molecule drug development. Um, but also it's a great compound. It's a very easy compound to work with. So we've been very fortunate to move it very quickly. Next slide, please, Karen. So um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, we are um, a company that is developing a compound that is derived from G1. G1 was a compound that actually was invented by Dr. Prosnitz at the University of New Mexico. Um, G1 is a racemic mixture. Um, it's a compound that wasn't able to move forward into clinical trials without purifying it, and we'd done that. Um, and we licensed that compound from the University of New Mexico in 2016. Um, we formed a company around the same time because so the, the, the physicians and scientists at the University of Pennsylvania were doing some research with the parent compound. And at that time, we formed the legal entity called Linnaeus Therapeutics in 2016. Um, <clears throat> we wound up doing some private financing um, funded by me and some other angel investors in the very beginning, and then completed our Series A financing in the uh, fall of 2018, and then a Series B financing in the fall of 2019. We're actually right now in the process of raising our Series C, and hopefully we'll be able to complete that sometime in the next several months. Um, LNS8801 is the actual compound we're developing. It is derived from G1. Um, 8801, as we call it, is an enantimerically pure clinical stage compound. It's a GPCR agonist for the treatment of cancer, um, and it targets this receptor known as GPER, the G-protein estrogen receptor. A couple of novel approaches here. Um, one, people don't typically target GPCRs for cancer, and two, um, if they do, they typically inhibit them. We do not inhibit the compound, we activate the compound or agonize it. So there are two very unique approaches here, um, which really give us sort of a first mover status and first to market um, with this compound. It's never been done before. Um, we have, um, as Dr. Stokes had mentioned, received orphan drug designation and uveal melanoma from the FDA. And we've also received fast track designation and cutaneous melanoma for patients that are ineligible for immunotherapy, that can't tolerate immunotherapy. We have completed our phase one dose escalation study. Again, University of New Mexico was a key site. Um, they enrolled several patients in that study. In fact, they enrolled the very first patient. We dosed our very first patient um, at the University of Mexico, we felt that that was very appropriate uh, that they were the site that got to dose the first patient, given that the parent compound was invented at UNM. Um, and we're currently enrolling patients in two phase 1B cohorts um, in patients that can't tolerate PD-1 therapy uh, because they get immune-related adverse events, and also in combination with PEMBRO in patients who have failed um, PD-1 therapy. Clinical data is very promising. Um, you know, people are very intrigued by this. The physicians, the potential partners, the investors, it, it looks very promising to move this compound forward. We have a collaboration with Merck um, in place already. Um, that compound, that, that collaboration is to provide compound to the company um, without us having to buy it. 
um, you know, to, to, to purchase PD-1 and have insurance reimbursed for it is very expensive, multiple millions of dollars a year, depending upon the number of patients. Merck sees enough value in this in our compound that they've decided to give us their compound for free um, in collaboration with us and help us design the clinical trials to run it um, through for future development. And we also have um, uh, recently begun the process to license other compounds to build a compound as we build out our company, targeting a novel um, uh, protein called FOXM1, which is critical in cancer as well. The next slide, please. All of the evidence that we have been able to generate thus far really has strongly supported um, the, the development of 8801 um, and its therapeutic potential. We have seen this preclinically in our hands um, at the University of Pennsylvania, at the University of New Mexico, at the Broad Institute, at, University, at Columbia University, at Mass General. Um, you know, all of these sites and MD Anderson, all of these sites have been collaborating with us and doing a lot of studies. Uh, and we really have seen that in everybody's hands, this compound demonstrates you know, its potency, its selectivity for the target, it demonstrates profound anti-cancer activity in in vitro and in vivo models, you know, and, and, and folks have really helped us sort of define the mechanism of action. Um, you know, and again, this was validated through the Broad Institute's PRISM screen, um, work done at Columbia University, and we received two SBIR awards from the NCI as well. We got very good scores and were awarded two SBI awards, a phase one and a phase two. So some folks obviously out there think that we're doing some good work. Um, clinically, all of the data that we had seen preclinically also sort of points in the same direction that this compound should work um, and it is in fact working the way that we thought it would. Um, you know, we confirmed the mechanism of action that we had seen preclinically. Um, we confirmed that in the clinical samples, in the human samples, in, 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 in tissue biopsies. We've been able to identify biomarkers that are prognostic for prediction of activity. So we're going to be enriching a, a, a future patient population or a future phase two and phase three studies that are likely responders to the drug. And again, as I mentioned, you know, we have the collaboration with Merck. We've received positive feedback from the FDA with the orphan designation and the fast track designation. Um, you know, I think folks will see soon our Merck collaboration expanding, and we anticipate that there will be additional collaborations forthcoming throughout 2021 and 2022 as we continue to develop the compound and, and cultivate more clinical data. The next slide, please. So just a quick preclinical summary, not to get into too scientific uh, detail here. Um, the receptor um, is known again as GPER, the G protein estrogen receptor. Activation of the receptor by LNS8801 results in the depletion of probably one of the most notorious oncoproteins um, ever. Um, CMEK has been widely known for decades um, to be a very poor prognostic indicator for cancer. Um, if you have cancer and you have high MYC levels, you're likely not going to do well at all. And what we've been able to demonstrate with 8801 is that when it binds to the receptor GPER, there is a rapid um, and durable depletion of CMYK protein. So we're reducing that level of that bad protein um, in the cancer cells. And when we do, we stop the proliferation of the cancer. We force the cancer cell to turn into a normal cell by increasing differentiation. And we also increase the immunogenicity of that cancer cell. What does that mean? Um, it, 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 it makes that cancer cell more visible to the immune system. So the immune system can then activate itself and kill those cancer cells. So, um, and we see that when we drop MYC in these highly addicted cancers that really depend on MYC, the cancer cells just die as well. So it's sort of a multifactorial approach to how we're targeting cancer um, through the depletion of CMYC. Um, this is actually a very attractive target. Um, you know, for decades, companies, big pharma companies have tried to develop drugs that target CMYC. Um, and you're actually looking at a drug that um, depletes CMEC. So, you know, you're, we're very optimistic at how this is going to play out as we advance the compound. We still have a lot of work to do, but it is very interesting so far. We've seen that 8801 has brought anti-cancer activity across a broad array of tumor types. Um, and we've also seen that the compound has monotherapy activity, but also synergistic activity with immune checkpoint inhibitors, such as pembrolizumab or nivolumab by, by, by Merck and Bristol-Myers. Next slide, please. So just to give you a touch of some clinical data, um, you can move to the next slide. So 
We have um, completed our phase one study, as I mentioned, we've dosed 33 patients through seven monotherapy cohorts um, of 8801 as we escalated the dose in one combination cohort. Um, the patients were very sick. This image that you see here is a picture of somebody's liver on a CT scan. All those white dots are metastatic cancer in the liver. This is a patient that had eye melanoma. Um, this patient only had about 20% involvement in the liver. We have had patients with up to 70% involvement in the liver. What I can tell you is the compound is extremely safe and tolerable. We haven't had any patients drop out of the study for tolerability issues. Um, we've uh, uh, and, and moreover, we've actually seen very profound data. Given how sick these patients are, we've seen patients who have responded to the drug very well. Some of the patients' tumors have shrank considerably. Some patients remain stable. In fact, we have a University of New Mexico patient on study now for over a year who has cutaneous melanoma. Um, and we've seen very profound data in combination with the Merck drug Pembrolizumab. The next slide, please. Um, one of the things I mentioned earlier, just to touch on this quickly, you know, we have been able through our preclinical work and also in our clinical studies to come up with a biomarker strategy. And what a biomarker strategy does is it basically allows you to correctly identify patients that will be responsive to the therapy. And a lot of that is based on the patient's immune status. A lot of that is based on um, a germline sequence. Uh, mutation um, that is present in GPER. Um, it's known that in GPER, there's a hypofunctional receptor sometimes, depending upon your DNA. Um, so we can eliminate those patients. And if you wind up eliminating them, the patients are more likely to respond. Um, and we also see some other biomarkers and we wind up putting them all together. Um, we actually wind up with 100% disease control. We can accurately predict so far um, up to 100% of the patients who will likely respond to the drug have their disease stabilized or shrink. So it's very pro uh, promising for our phase two, phase three future studies. The next slide, please. This is just a quick summary of a couple of the efficacy signals that we have seen from the phase one. Um, this patient here on the top, um, this patient was from the monotherapy dose escalation. This was a patient that was treated at MD Anderson. Um, this patient um, received LNS8801 um, after not being able to tolerate pembrolizumab. So this patient took the Merck drug, couldn't tolerate it, developed immune-related adverse events, came onto the study, and you can see their tumor shrank very considerably. Um, this patient had a 14% reduction officially. Um, I'm not going to get into too much detail, but it's likely that that patient had about a 30 to 40% reduction in the tumor after five weeks of therapy. Unfortunately, that person passed away due to COVID. Um, very unfortunate. Um, within two weeks of receiving the good news that his tumors were shrinking on our very safe drug, they wound up succumbing to COVID. So very, very disappointing for that patient. Um, but also you can see here uh, down below in the, in the patient at the bottom, this is also a graph of this patient's two tumors. The red line and the blue line, you can see um, when the patient had received pembrolizumab um, with lung cancer, um, they wound up progressing on their tumors. You can see the blue line growing and a new red line appearing. So that was a new lesion. We wound up then adding LNS8801 to pembrolizumab. And within two months, you can see the tumor shrank by 50%. That patient still remains on study six months later and is doing very well. Um, the next slide. Um, I, as I might have mentioned earlier, this was an all-comers phase one clinical trial, meaning we took a bunch of patients with advanced cancer. Uh, we did not try and specify any type of cancer. You wouldn't necessarily know it, though, by the number of uveal melanoma patients we've had on study. Uveal melanoma is eye melanoma. You develop it in your eye. About 90% of those patients develop metastatic disease to their liver within a year. And you can see those dotted lines on the left, median PSF, uh, PFS, excuse me, with decarbazine and medium PFS with PD-1 therapy. These patients' tumors will grow very quickly, and the prognosis is very poor. There's nothing approved for these patients. If you get metastatic uveal melanoma in your liver, your tumors will grow on chemotherapy within two months. And if you take PD-1 therapy, they'll grow within three months. Look what happens, though, when they take 8801 monotherapy. Their tumors don't grow for about four months. That doesn't seem like a lot, but it is to these patients because the drug is very safe. Those two other drugs have very toxic side effects. So we think that, you know, we can stabilize this disease, make it disappear in a lot of patients. We actually think this could be an indication where we could shoot for an FDA approval in the relative near term. The next slide, please. 
This patient right here on the left, I just wanted to throw this in. This is um, our University of New Mexico patient. So this was a woman um, who was treated at the University of New Mexico. She has cutaneous melanoma that metastasized to her breastbone. So in her breastbone, that top uh, uh, CT scan with the two green lines, um, that is the, 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 the cancer in her breastbone. You can see that disease hasn't changed at all in over a year, about 60 weeks. That patient is now on study and the cancer hasn't changed. And you can see in the images below where the red arrows are, um, she's had multiple lesions disappear in her body, in her lungs in this instance, while on 8801 monotherapy. Again, this woman has been on drug for over a year now, 14, 15 months, <clears throat> and lives her life as if she does not have any cancer at all. Again, because the drug is very well tolerated. The next slide, please. So just a couple more slides here. Um, you know, we have done a good job, you know, leveraging the relationships um, that we've been able to develop. You know, we, uh, we plan to open up multiple phase two studies later this year after we complete our series C. You know, we currently have sites like University of New Mexico, as I mentioned, um, but we have my alma mater at Jefferson. We have the folks at Penn involved as well as, well as MD Anderson and Yale and Mass General. So, you know, it really is a, a tier one list of comprehensive cancer centers that are excited to participate in this clinical trial. Um, we are going to continue to focus on cutaneous melanoma, uveal melanoma, and lung cancer based on that very promising data that we've seen in that one patient. And we're certainly going to look into future indication expansion um, in specific subgroups supported by future clinical data. Um, why don't we just hop to the very last slide since I babbled on a little too much here, if you don't mind, Kara. Next slide. And then the last slide. There we go. So it's an exciting year um, to be at Linnaeus. You know, between now and the next 18 months, we anticipate being able to accomplish quite a bit. You know, we, we, we believe that we're going to finish our phase 1B studies in combination with Pembro, the Merck drug. We'll complete our phase 1 study in PD-1 intolerant uh, melanoma with 8801. We should initiate after we complete our Series C financing multiple phase 2A cohorts and hopefully a pivotal trial between now and the end of the year. We have generated a fair amount of interest from VCs. I think you'll see us close the financing in the next several months. Um, and I will tell you that we've also received quite a bit of interest as well um, you know, from pharma. So I think if we continue to block and tackle and do the work that we've done, um, you know, we should be able to ink a partnership sometime in that period as well. Again, I think I ran over a little bit by a couple of minutes. I apologize. Um, again, I'd like to thank everybody for having me today. Um, I'm really happy for Eric and really, really happy to be a part of the University of New Mexico ecosystem. Thank you, Dr. Mooney, for your presentation. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Richard Larson, who's the Executive Vice Chancellor and the Vice Chancellor for Research at the Health Science Center at UNM. Richard? Thanks very much, Regent Begay. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mooney, for such a great uh, presentation and, and being part of the UNM uh, ecosystem and, and working so closely with us to really improve lives. I also would like to really thank Lisa and her team uh, for putting this together. I think this is the 17th or 18th year and uh, I've really been privileged that uh, Lisa's invited me every year uh, to this, and it's really gotten better every year. And even with COVID, uh, you've been able to successfully tack and pivot over to um, a really great event virtually. So thanks very much, Lisa, for everything your team has done to, in honoring our inventors. When you think about the role of the university, it's really what comes to front of mind for most of us is that it's about educating the future workforce, or it's about giving people the right foundation to really live richer lives through a liberal arts education. But one of the most critical things that universities do is that they create new knowledge and they do that through research and scholarly work. And ultimately that research has to have public value. And it's that research and development piece that we're going to honor today. Uh, all the inventors that are here and all the inventors that really work at moving the, their research into practice and having impact on the way uh, people's lives are, uh, uh, occur. Over the course of the last 15 or 16 years, there's been 62 life science companies that have either spun out or licensed technology from uh, RI slash STC UNM uh, over that time. Each one of those companies 
uh, really provided great benefit. Uh, it, many of them were places that employed our graduates, but most importantly, many of them produced products that improved the way all of us could live, whether it was treating disease or making things easier for us on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's really, as an inventor, I can tell you, that's one of the most satisfactory things you can imagine when you see your science come to practice. And I'm so pleased that we are going to be able to honor so many of our faculty inventors today in what they've uh, done and what they've accomplished along that path. So I I'm really proud of what you do. And on behalf of all the faculty, staff, and students, and the, and the leadership at the Health Science Center, I really think it's important that we're recognizing you and really congratulate you and thank you for everything you've done uh, in this regard. And then finally, I, I'd like to really um, call out Eric Prosnitz, who's going to be honored later today. So I won't give you all his accolades and all the great things uh, that he's done because I know that'll be covered. I do wanna point out one additional thing. In addition to everything that you just saw that Linnaeus is doing because of one of his inventions, he's also taken that one drug candidate a step farther and beyond cancer to the treatment of diabetes. And he is the individual who's now performing our first phase one therapeutic clinical trial at this institution. So that's a huge step forward for our institution to be able to do that early clinical trials and demonstrate that we can. And he, he's just done a tremendous uh, job in that regard and, and many others that you'll hear about in just a few minutes. And so I just also want to, on behalf of leadership, the faculty and staff and the students, uh, congratulate Eric and recognize him as well. So thank you, Regent Begay, and thank you, uh, Lisa, for having me. And uh, uh, I look forward to the rest of the ceremony. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Larson. Next, I'd like to welcome and hand over the meeting to Dr. Ellen Fisher, who is the newest vice president of research at the University of New Mexico. Ellen? Thank you, Regent Begay. I'm very happy to be here at the 2021 Innovation Awards. Uh, and I'd like to also thank Lisa and her team for putting together a great event. Uh, as New Mexico's only designated R1 Research University, we really do take pride in our unique solutions to unique challenges. And this, e this evening's event showcases just that. The UNM Rainforest Innovations allows our rich, complex research landscape to take shape in the real world through inventions, patents, and other technology transfers, ensuring UNM's lasting positive influence on the city, state, and the nation. The dedication of tonight's honorees towards their craft should be praised. They not only have continued their work during the COVID-19 pandemic, they have continued to thrive in spite of the many difficulties presented. It's also gratifying to see how many of this year's inventors have affiliations with our interdisciplinary centers that provide cross-cutting services and facilities and provide the diversity of thought that is absolutely critical to innovation. Although I am new to UNM, I've only been here for about two months, I continue to be impressed with the research community's dedication, creativity, and ability to effectively translate their state-of-the-art technology to the world. Congratulations to all of our inventors tonight. Further development of UNM's culture of innovation and discovery is a key element of our future. We continue to seek new ways to bring together scholars, creators, and entrepreneurs to work in collaboration with the goal of delivering creative solutions that can be effectively translated to the marketplace with lasting impact around the world. To that end, partnerships with business and industry continue to be a priority for UNM research. In the coming years, we look forward to building upon our strong foundation of technology transfer, including industry and national lab collaborations by partnering with leaders in New Mexico's diverse research community to develop strategic research milestones and promote the integration of research into all aspects of the university mission. I really think that, that the recognition that we give to our inventors through events like tonight's uh, award ceremony is really important to continue to build on the um, great community and culture of innovation that already exists at UNM. 
With that, I'd like to hand it back to uh, Regent Begay and say thank you again for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight and congratulations to all of our inventors. Thank you, Ellen. I think next we're gonna hear from our Chief Executive Officer for the Rainforest Innovations, Lisa Kutela. Thank you, Sandra, and thank you to uh, our speakers so far uh, for contributing to this great event today. I'd like to start by recognizing the sponsors who provided, uh, make it possible for us to provide stipends, financial stipends to the inventors and creators being honored. At the gold level, uh, firms, our law firms, Shore Chan and Sussman Godfrey, Wolowskis Quarter, and Vote IP. At the silver level, COSUD Intellectual Property Solutions, Meeting Roche, Group, uh, Schwegman, Lundberg, and Wessner, and at the bronze level, MH2 Technology Law Group. Uh, the law firms not only provide sponsorships to us, they do great work, which really enable our inventors to receive the, the valuable patents that um, are being recognized tonight. So I wanna give a special thanks to our law firms for all their terrific support of the organization. In addition to the newest UNM Rainforest Innovation Fellow, Dr. Eric Prosnitz, who you've heard about um, already to some degree, and you'll hear some more later, I would also like to acknowledge Rainforest Innovation Fellows from previous years. And in fact, these uh, Rainforest Innovation Fellows from previous years uh, represent 19 of the 50 patents being um, recognized tonight. So they continue to be a very prolific group of inventors for the university. Our first innovation fellow was Steve Bruick, who, receives two pet, who received two issued patents this year, and he has a total of 88 UNM affiliated US patents. 2011 Rainforest Innovation Fellow is Larry Scalar, who received two issued patents this past year for a total of 46 UNM affiliated US patents. The 2012 Rainforest Innovation Fellow, Steve Hersey, has a total of 27 UNM affiliated US patents. 2013 is Graham Timmons, who received two issued patents this past year. And he has a total of 15 UNM affiliated US patents. 2014 is Plamen Adenosov, who received four issued patents this year for a total of 43 UNM affiliated US patents. 2015 Rainforest Innovation Fellows, Jeff Brinker, he received two issued patents this past year for a total of 41 UNM affiliated US patents. 2015 Rainforest Innovation Fellow is Cheryl Willman. She has a total of five UNM affiliated US patents. 2016 Rainforest Innovation Fellows, Gabrielle Lopez. He has a total of 35 UNM affiliated US patents. 2017 Rainforest Innovation Fellows, Bryce Jakirian, and he received two issued patents this past year for a total of 13 UNM affiliated US patents. Uh, his co-recipient in 2017, David Peabody, received one issued US patent this year for a total of 11 UNM affiliated US patents. 2018 Rainforest Innovation Fellow is Sang Han, Sang M Han, who has a total of 20 UNM affiliated US patents. 2019 Rainforest Innovation Fellow is Angela Wanninger Ness, who received one issued patent this past year for a total of eight UNM affiliated US patents. And 2020 Rainforest Innovation Fellow, Dave Witten, received three issued patents this past year for a total of 17 UNM affiliated US patents. This year, we have 48 UNM inventors who received patents between March 1st, 
2020 and February 28th, 2021. And that uh, for a total of 50 US patents and trademarks issued. This is 32 patents are from the main campus and 17 patents from HSC. And for our inventors here, I know you always like to hear who the leaders are in terms of the departments and centers that received the most issued patents this past year. And our Center for High Technology Materials again takes first place with 12 issued patents this year. Um, the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering had 10 issued patents this year. And the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering had eight issued US patents this year. Um, our Comprehensive Cancer Center had seven issued patents this year. The Department of Pathology had five issued patents, as did the Department of Internal Medicine. The Department of Molecular Genetics and Microbiology had four issued patents, as did the Center for Bio uh, Biomedical Engineering. And we had uh, a number of other departments that received one or two patents this past year. So really a broad representation from across the campus of those receiving patents. And now I'd like to read the names of the honorees uh, this year. And uh, starting with first, uh, James Aristad, a research professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering who has two issued patents. Victor Acosta, who's an assistant professor in physics and astronomy with two issued patents. Plamen Adenasov, who is now at UC Irvine, but as one of our innovation fellows, we recognize the continuing patents that have been issuing, and there are four this year. Uh, Mahmoud Bezer Durad is a postdoc in the Center for High Technology and Materials who has an issued patent this year. Christian Baloga, a research professor in the Department of Internal Medicine, has one issued patent this year. Jeff Brinker, uh, who is Distinguished and Regents Professor Emeritus in Chemical and Biological Engineering, Molecular Genetics and Microbiology, also a Rainforest Innovation Fellow, has two issued patents this year. Steve Bruick has two issued patents this year. Steve is a Distinguished Professor Emeritus, Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and Director Emeritus of the Center for High Technology Materials. And as I noted, a, our first Rainforest Innovation Fellow and a National Academy of Inventors Fellow. Tito Busani is an Assistant Professor in Electrical and Computer Engineering, member of the Center for High Technology Materials, has one issue patent this year. Alicio Castillo, is an assistant professor and KL2 scholar in the Department of Internal Medicine. And uh, he has one issued patent this year. Francesca Cavallo is an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. She has three issued patents this year. Bryce Chikurian, who is uh, vice chair of the Department of Molecular Genetics and Microbiology, member of the Comprehensive Cancer Center, uh, member of the Center for Infectious Disease and Immunity. He is a Rainforest Innovation Fellow and also a member of the National Academy of Inventors. He has two issued patents this year. Seth Daly is a research assistant professor in the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences, and he has one issued patent this year. Boyo Deretic is a distinguished professor and chair of the Department of Molecular Genetics and Microbiology. And he has three issued patents this year. Bruce Edwards is a research professor emeritus in the Department of Pathology. He has two issued patents this year. Daniel Fiesel, associate professor and regents lecturer in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, also a member of the Center for Biomedical Engineering has one issued patent this year. 
Steve Graves, professor in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering and a member of the Center for Biomedical Engineering. He has one issue patent this year. Pamela Hall, an associate professor in the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences has one issued patent this year. Sang Yan Han is an associate professor in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering, member of the Center for High Technology Materials and the Center for Biomedical Engineering. He has one issued patent this year. Lori Hudson is a Regents Professor in the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences and a member of the UNM Comprehensive Cancer Center and she has one issued patent this year. Linnea Ista is a research associate professor in the Center for Biomedical Engineering, and she has one issued patent this year. S.C. Lee, a research associate professor with the Center for High Technology Materials has one issued patent this year. Jim Liu is a distinguished professor and associate dean for research in the Departments of Pharmaceutical Sciences and Neurology, and he has one issued patent this year. Sean Luan is Professor and Associate Chair in the Depart Department of Computer Science, and he's the Director of the Biomedical Engineering Graduate Program, has one issued patent this year. Arash Mafi, Professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy and Director of the Center for High Technology Materials, and he has two issued patents this year. Fernando Moreau, an assistant professor in the Department of Civil, Construction and Environmental Engineering. He has one issued patent this year. Melanie Moses, <clears throat> a professor in the Department of Computer Science and an associate professor in the Department of Biology has one issued patent this year. Abdullah Mawin, Associate Professor in the Department of Computer Science has one issued patent this year. Aaron Newman, an Associate Professor in the Department of Pathology has one issued patent this year. Tudor Oprea, Professor and Chief Department of Internal Medicine, Translational Informatics Division and Director of the Bio, Bioinformatics Shared Resource in the Center for Molecular Discovery has two issued patents this year. Eric Oshinsky is a distinguished professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and a member of the Center for High Technology Materials. He has one issued patent this year. Rong Pan, a research assistant professor in the Department of Pharmaceutical Science, has one issued patent this year. Mario Spetichus is a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. He has one issued patent this year. Dave Peabody, professor in the Department of Molecular Genetics and Microbiology, member of the UNM Comprehensive Cancer Center. He is the 2017 Brain Forest Innovation Fellow, and he's a 2019 National Academy of Inventors Fellow, has one issued patent this year. Mustafa Pesakan is a research assistant affiliated with the Center for High Technology Materials, has one issued patent this year. Jim Plasquelic, a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and he has three issued patents this year. And Eric Prosnitz, who you will hear more from a little bit later. Uh, I'm not gonna read all his titles because you will hear them in a little bit. Our, uh, our innovation fellow for this year has one issued patent this year. Rita Serta is a research assistant professor in the Department of Internal Medicine, the Division of Molecular Medicine and adjunct faculty in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering has one issued patent this year. Andy Shreve, Regents Professor in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering has one issued patent this year. Laurel Sillerud, Research Professor, Department of Neurology has one issued patent this year. And Larry Scalar, Distinguished Professor Emeritus, Department of Pathology. He is the 2011 Rainforest Innovation Fellow and 2020 National Academy of Inventors Fellow, has two issued patents this year. Gennady Smolikov, 
is a research associate professor in the Center for High Technology Materials. He has one issued patent this year. Rina Smiljani is a medical student in the UNM School of Medicine, and she has one issued patent this year. Mahmoud Taha, Distinguished Professor, Regents, Lecturer, and Chair of the Department of Civil Construction and Environmental Engineering, has one issued patent this year. Grant Timmons, Associate Professor in the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences and our 2013 Rainforest Innovation Fellow, has two issued patents this year. Kathleen Triplett is a research science in the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences, has one issued patent this year. Angela Wanninger Ness is a professor in department, the Department of Pathology and uh, has an appointment in the UNM Comprehensive Cancer Center. She's a 2019 Rainforest Innovation Fellow the 2020 recipient of the American Association for the Advancement of Science Lifetime Mentor Award, the 2020 recipient of the US Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics and Engineering Mentoring, um, and 2019 Rainforest Innovation Fellow, has one issued patent this year. Dave Witten, Distinguished Professor in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering, and Associate Director of the Center for Biomedical Engineering. He is the 2020 Rainforest Innovation Fellow and he had three issued patents this past year. And finally, Payman Zarkesh Ha, Associate Professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering who had one issued patent this past year. Let's take a moment and if everybody could clap um, for our awardees. Uh, and want to congratulate everyone. And you will hear more details about how to pick up your awards and, and your stipends uh, near the end of the program. So congratulations, everyone. This is a major achievement. Um, it, it not only helps you, it helps the university's rankings in terms of our patents, and of course the commercialization progress, which has been extraordinary with all of these talented inventors. Thank you. Lastly, I would also like to announce that just yesterday, the National Academy of Sciences announced their election of new members, including one of the inventors being honored this evening, Dr. Jeffrey Brinker. Members are elected to the National Academy of Sciences in recognition of their distinguished and continuing achievements in original research, Membership is a widely accepted mark of excellence in science and is considered one of the highest honors that a scientist can receive. Current NAS membership totals approximately 2,400 members and 500 international members, of which approximately 190 have received Nobel Prizes. Congratulations to Dr. Brinker on this very significant achievement. Now I will hand it over back to uh, Chair Sandra Begay. Thank you, Lisa. It's now time to announce the Lifetime Achievement Innovation Award. This year, we're excited to present the first ever Lifetime Achievement Innovation Award to a very special inventor, whom we believe exemplifies the spirit of innovation at the University of New Mexico. This person has made outstanding achievements over the years and the impact of his research has been extraordinary. To date, he has received 88 issued US patents with many more patents in the pipeline. And these new discoveries have spurred the development of seven startup companies. The total licensing income generate has generated has been approximately $84 million. He is a distinguished professor emeritus in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and emeritus director for the Center of High Technology Materials. Currently, he serves as the Chief Scientific Officer of Armonica Technologies Incorporated. The Lifetime Achievement Award is being presented to no one other than Dr. Stephen R.J. Bruick. 
To illustrate just how impactful Dr. Brooks' work has been, we decided to reach out to several of his colleagues, collaborators, and friends for their following comments. We would like to share that video with you now. Hello, Steve. I just wanted to congratulate you on being the most prolific inventor at UNM. You're truly inspirational to all of us, and we are following your footsteps. Dear Steve, Dr. Bruick, UNM Distinguished Professor Emeritus. Over the past 36 years at UNM, you have set an example for visionary leadership, dedication to the creation of scientific knowledge, unmatched accomplishment in advancing cutting edge technologies and STEM education. On behalf of the members of the Center for High Technology Materials, I would like to express our sincerest gratitude to you for all that you have done for CHTM, UNM, and the beautiful state of New Mexico. I'm Bob Karlasek, a professor of electrical engineering at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York. For the last 11 years, Steve Brook and I have worked closely together as co-directors of a large NSF engineering research center for our respective institutes at RPI and UNM. I've had the privilege of learning a tremendous amount about optical physics, innovation, and management from Steve. Uh, without his help, it would have been tough to make it through this ERC program successfully. And I look forward to continued collaborations. Steve, congratulations on this innovation award. Very well deserved. Hey Steve, this is Liang here. You have been the most generous and supportive advisor a student can wish for. You have taught us so many things except one. How are you able to keep on fighting patent after patent all this time? Please teach me that secret before you retire, okay? Congratulations, boss. Hi Steve, congratulations on yet another well-deserved award. It's an honor to have been your engineering faculty colleague for more than 27 years. I wish you all the best. I'm Alex Newman, I'm a research professor at UNM, and I have been working with Steve for 18 years. I really admire him for his smartness, growth, view, and patience. I extend my warmest congratulations to the well deserved award. Thank you. Greetings, Steve. You've been a rare colleague with whom, over 40 years, every conversation has begun and ended with technical ideas. I just want you to know how inspirational that's been to me. Hey, congratulations, Steve, on being selected as one of the most prolific inventors at the University of New Mexico. Your energy, drive, motivation are unbelievable. Uh, I learned a lot from you during my 16 years at CHTM and UNM. Yes, you're an amazing researcher, prolific inventor, and a fearless leader. Wishing you many more years of scholarly activity, Steve. Good luck to you and Cindy. Hi, Steve. Congratulations on your achievements. You were a great mentor, and my academic career has benefited tremendously from your guidance during my PhD study. I wish you continued success with all the great ideas and innovation. Dr. Burke, your accomplishment not only has contributed to the academic society, but also has created an educational chain effect that is changing the world with all your students out there. It has been an honor and a privilege to have you as my mentor, and more importantly, to continue working with you and learning from you the field of metrology. Congratulations. Hey, Steve, it's Christian from RPI. Thank you for the great time working together. It's really been a good one. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mini. I'm a PhD student working under Dr. Brook. Dr. Brook is a pioneer in the field of interference lithography. Having more than 80 patents under his name, he truly exemplifies the spirit of innovation. I wish to congratulate him on this occasion for all of his accomplishments. Thank you. Well, hello, Steve. This is uh, a very appropriate award that you're getting. Congratulations. I really enjoyed uh, our time collaborating together 
over that uh, 20 years at CHGM. And I think we did some really good things in uh, nanotechnology. And these have been coming to fruition recently. So uh, again, congratulations on this very well-deserved award. Hi, Steve. I'm delighted to partake in your fitting. Like many great innovators, you have shown great flexibility to contribute to diverse areas, including optics, manufacturing, and now biophysics. I wish you continued success, health and happiness to you and yours. Cheers, Gabriel. Hi, I'm Priyam Dein. I'm a graduate student at Professor Stephen Burek's lab. It is a privilege for me to work under Professor Burek's direct supervision. As an advisor, I always find him very supportive and truly inspirational. Uh, I want to thank Professor Burek for all of his advice and for giving me the opportunity to work under his direct supervision. Hi, Steve. I wanted to offer my congratulations on your many great career accomplishments and to personally thank you for making me part of the CHTM family. I really appreciate your guidance, your mentorship, and all the collaborations we've had over the last nine years. From outrunning Nor'easters in Troy, New York, to learning everything we ever wanted to know about patent litigation, it continues to be a privilege and a pleasure to be your colleague. Cheers. Congratulations, Steve, for being honored at this event. You truly are a prolific inventor and a fantastic scientist, and we're all honored to be able to work with you. Best wishes for continued success. I'd like to congratulate Steve for being recognized as the 2021 Rainforest Innovation Fellow Extraordinaire. I'm Sandra Begay. I'm the chair of the board for the Rainforest Innovations of the University of New Mexico. I just wanted to give a few words of congratulation to Steve Bruick. What a prolific uh, patent holder and inventor. UNM doesn't need Gatorade. We have Steve Bruick. That's our win. Congratulations again, Steve. So very happy for you and very proud of all your accomplishments. Hi there, Dr. Bruick. This is President Stokes. And on behalf of the entire UNM community, let me just say how proud we are to have you as part of the Lobo family. You are a true American original and your creative thinking, inventions, and your many patents are changing lives and changing the world. Thank you for constantly amazing and inspiring us and enjoy this very special evening. Again, congratulations to Dr. Brook for the Lifetime Achievement Innovations Awards. We have one more surprise to announce for Dr. Brook. Because of his account accomplishments, the UNM Foundation has decided to, cre to create an endowment fund in his name to benefit the Center of High Technology Materials. This endowment will allow CHTM to support the next generation of inventors. Congratulations again to Steve Bruick for all of your accomplishments. Next, it is my honor to announce We'd like to recognize a UNM inventor who has been elected as the 2020 Fellow of the National Academy of Inventors to Dr. Larry Scalar. Election to the NAI Fellow status is a high professional distinction founded in enhance, to enhance the visibility of academic technology and of innovations around the world. In 2020, the NAI selected a cohort of 175 inventors from 115 research universities. For over 30 years, Dr. Scalar has dedicated himself to making high throughput high throughput flow cytometry, the benchmark for high slit cytometry technology. For nearly as long as the director, for nearly as long as director of the Center for Molecular Discovery, he has made New Mexico internationally known as the hub for flow cytometry research and technology. 
He has given a tool to researchers everywhere to create more effective ways to understand and to treat cancers, infectious diseases, and many other biological applications and built multiple teams of inventors and inventors along the way that have reflected in his patent portfolio and commercialization activity. For this achievement, we would like to congratulate Dr. Scalar for his election to the 2020 NAI Fellows. I'm on a roll, so I'm gonna just keep going. The 2021 Rainforest Innovation Fellow. Last, but certainly not least, we would like to recognize another UNM inventor who is being honored as our 2021 Rainforest Innovation Fellow. The UNM RI Board of Directors created the Rainforest Innovation Fellow Award in 2010 to honor a UNM inventor whose body of technologies have generated significant commercialization activities. These fellows are chosen by the UNM RI Invention Fellows Board Committee based on achievements in new technologies disclosed, patents received, license and option agreements entered into, new companies started, and also income generated from these technologies. This year, we are honored to recognize Dr. Eric Prosnitz as a 2021 Rainforest Fellow. With continuous NIH funding as a principal investigator since 1994, his work has led to more than 50 million in funding at UNM as a principal investigator or co-PI. He has authored over 220 peer-reviewed articles and reviews with over 22,000 citations and an H index of 81. His research has led to the disclosure of 18 technologies, eight US patents, three pending patents with Rainforest Innovations. So the Board of Directors is honored to recognize Dr. Eric Prosnitz as the 2021 Rainforest Innovation Fellow. Please welcome Dr. Eric Prosnitz. Thank you, uh, Sandra and the board and Lisa for this real honor. I'm just trying to get my video up and running. And how's that working? Yes, that works. Thank you. All right. So what I thought I'd do uh, this afternoon is give everyone sort of a brief uh, history and a bit of a primer on the, on the work we've done in this field and how we've gotten to where we are today. So the job of a, a cell in the body, almost every cell in the body, is to respond to uh, cues, uh, many of them from the extracellular um, environment, and to respond to those cues with some sort of action. And those actions are, are myriad throughout the body. Um, and this happens through the recognition of what are called ligands or small molecules that are bound to receptors. And those receptors then generate a signal that is transduced usually through some other protein into an end effect in the cell. And that can be um, cell growth or stopping cell growth as Dr. Mooney talked about, or um, storing fat in the case of an adipocyte or burning fat in the case of, uh, of a brown fat cell, for example. Uh, one large class of these receptors is called the, the G-protein coupled receptor family. They're also known as seven transmembrane receptors, not a very creative name, but that's because they contain seven transmembrane uh, spanning regions. Uh, in 3D, they form a barrel shown on the right here, typically with ligands binding in the middle of this barrel uh, on the outside of the cell and with coupling to what are known as G proteins inside the cell. This is a large family in uh, humans, it's estimated uh, to be over 800 members large. Uh, one subfamily is the rhodopsin family, and that consists of about 700 members. And these are receptors that do everything in the body from um, what you're doing now with your eyes, which is detecting light through uh, vision, uh, smell, taste, 
extensive actions in the brain, uh, regulating mood, behavior, and, and many other functions. The immune system, cardiovascular system, skeletal system, reproductive system, endocrine system, and so on and so forth. These hormones, are, or in, in some cases, neurotransmitters to which they respond, uh, are produced all over the body and interact with receptors on distant cells, typically. So you can imagine that with so many receptors that regulate so many processes throughout the body, uh, GPCRs are a fantastic target uh, for drug uh, discovery. Uh, and that is in fact true with annual global sales of drugs targeting GPCRs, this is the whole family of GPCRs, exceeding $200 billion a year. And in fact, uh, of all 34% of all FDA approved drugs uh, target GPCRs and about 27% of global sales come from GPCR targeted drugs. So this is a very uh, sought after target family in terms of drug discovery. Eric, this is Sandra. Your slides are not advancing. We still see slide one. Oh my, uh, okay, let me escape. That's interesting. Thank you. I might run it then in this mode. Um, if that works, not quite as, all right. Sorry about that. So um, the drug discovery pipeline is long and complex. It starts with basic science often uh, here on the left in terms of studying receptors studying their uh, functional outputs and identifying molecules then that can regulate these receptors. Uh, those, those first hit molecules are then modified and improved upon. Their efficacy in, in animal models is determined. And then preclinical work can begin in term, determining safety uh, and pharmacokinetics of these compounds. After that's done, an investigation investigational new drug application from the FDA can be sought, and Patrick told you about that. Uh, the next step then, of course, proceeds into manufacturing processes and QC types of um, processes. And finally, after all the clinical trials are completed, a new drug application can be submitted to the FDA, hopefully approved, and the drug is actually a drug. This process often takes well over 15 years and estimates put the cost per drug at about one to $2 billion. So I'm gonna change course a little bit here and talk about one hormone and that's estrogen that we've been studying uh, for over 15 years. It's known as uh, to most as the female sex hormone. It's involved in breast development, for example, in women at puberty endometrial growth, cyclic changes throughout the menstrual cycle. And then again, at uh, pregnancy, then in terms of uterine growth and regulation of other hormones, and in fact, um, development of fetal organs, for example. But in addition to these reproductive functions, estrogen mediates and controls and regulates many other processes throughout the body. This includes in the nervous system, the immune system, endocrine system, skeletal physiology, and the vascular, cardiovascular system. So estrogen has diverse roles. And not just in women, it's also an important hormone in men. Uh, women usually have about tenfold higher levels of estrogen than men, um, but men are also expressed and it's actually derived from testosterone uh, biologically and enzymatically in the body. So in males, for example, it's involved in sperm maturation, has a role in bone development and maintenance, cardiovascular function and metabolism and sexual health. So to return back to receptors, then estrogen has well had what was thought to be really one receptor predominantly. This was known as estrogen receptor, became estrogen receptor alpha as a beta variant was discovered. But about 20 years ago, a G protein coupled receptor was identified that responded to estrogen. This was first called GPR30 and would later be called GPER. Uh, what I'm showing you here is how, how one can, uh, or has traditionally tried to discriminate between these two types of estrogen receptors. Before GPER was known, most of ligands were targeting the only known receptor, ER alpha. 
And this led to multiple classes of types of compounds that had modulatory effects on ER alpha and were tremendously successful uh, clinically. For example, the drugs tamoxifen and fulvestrin, which are, are used in breast cancer treatment, um, have been around well, tamoxifen since the, the 70s, clinically since the 90s, um, and has, has saved the lives of millions of women. But all these compounds cross react with GPR. So our goal beginning uh, about 15, 17 years ago, was to try and identify molecules that were selective for GPR, in part so we could understand what that receptor did. And if we knew what that receptor did, perhaps those compounds would be uh, clin clinically and therapeutically valuable. So this, these, these studies began then with um, some of the groups shown up here on the right and others here on the left. And we screened uh, a, a compound library of 10,000 compounds to look for activities that were selective for GPER. Um, the physical screening was somewhat daunting. And so two approaches were taken, a virtual or compu computational approach to um, prioritize compounds in terms of their similarity to, to estrogen. And then conventional binding assays and functional assays led to determinations of receptor selectivity for GPER or potentially ER, which then led to mouse studies and other studies to examine the function of the receptors and the potential value of those compounds. The first compound we identified was called G1, shown here in the upper left. You can see for those with some chemical background, some similarity structurally to estrogen. It's a little bit larger of a molecule and it doesn't bind to the ER alpha receptor that I mentioned earlier. It selectively only binds to GPR and it functions as an agonist. And this is the compound that uh, Dr. Mooney told you about in his presentation. Our first patent was filed as a provisional in 2005. It issued in 2011. And it's a composition of matter patent that uh, claims a compound according to a pharmaceutical composition comprising the chemical structures shown below. These R's at the end of many of these bonds represent variable compounds. They can be single atoms, many single atoms. They can be uh, um, chains of carbons, for example. So it can be a methyl, a, a ethyl or a propyl group and so forth. So there are at each position, theoretically, uh, dozens and dozens of potential substituents. And there are roughly 15 of these around the molecule. So if there's 20 at each position times 15, theoretically, you've got well in excess of 30, I think, pentillion compounds. It's a large number of theoretically uh, available compounds in this patent. But we focus largely on three of them over time. This compound G1, as I said, it's an agonist. And these two compounds, G15 and G36, which are antagonists, they block the activity of the receptor. As we identified these and talked to pharma uh, over 10 years ago, the question was, are they good for anything? And that was hard to answer because we didn't really know the biology of the receptor yet and what it was involved in. Uh, one area of a subsequent patent was to make imaging agents so we could actually track where this receptor was in the body. These are radio imaging agents. Uh, you can see this core structure here that provides binding to GPR and then a chelate structure out here at the end where the red star represents a radioisotope. And over here on the right side, you can see that we're able to uh, localize GPR to a GPR expressing tumor in this mouse model. Other work that has gone on for close to 10 years is to examine the metabolic properties of GPER. Uh, we looked at both uh, um, diabetes models and obesity models. And what's shown here is the ability of G1 to improve glucose homeostasis, as shown here in a glucose tolerance test, where the orange line, uh, which is uh, poor glucose tolerance, is restored to a normal uh, close to a normal black line here in an intact animal, and also in improve insulin sensitivity in the animal. Um, and that's shown over here in terms of the fasting insulin levels upon treatment with G1. Those are reduced. Uh, they're elevated in the uh, control treated animal that has uh, diabetes. In addition, 
Uh, G1 reduces obesity in both male and female mice. And you can see that here in these DEXA scans. Here is a healthy female mouse. Here's an overectomized mouse lacking its estrogen. So it's a model of estrogen deprivation and a postmenopausal state in women. You can see the significantly larger mouse here. And after a few weeks of G1 treatment, the mouse is restored close to normal weight. These last two metabolic aspects have been um, spun out into GPRG1 development group. And that's the second company in addition to Linnaeus that is um, expanding and developing the, the use of these compounds. We also discovered that, and this was unexpected, that GPR deficiency, so a, a knockout mouse lacking GPR protein expression, was in some ways upon aging actually healthier than its wild type control. You can see here, this is cardiac tissue. Uh, and you can see here that the bundles of muscles are very disorganized. The red here under the serious red staining is uh, fibrotic tissue, and that's in, a wild, that's in a very old wild type mouse. But in a knockout mouse, the tissue is largely healthy, much less fibrotic tissue. And that we found uh, was a result of a lack of GPR activity. We also showed that hypertension or high blood pressure could be treated with a GPR antagonist. Similarly, in another patent, we showed that kidney disease uh, could be protected against in an old animal through uh, GPR deficiency again, or uh, through inhibition of GPR. In work with Pam Hall and Helen Hathaway, uh, we showed that G1 promotes protection against Staph aureus uh, skin infections. Uh, upon infection, a Staph infection in the skin, there's a region of dermal necrosis, uh, death of the, the skin tissue surrounding the site of infection. And that is greatly reduced, as you can see here on the right, by treatment with G1. This is the work that uh, Dr. Mooney talked about, that Linnaeus has developed. It shows the effect of combination therapy uh, of G1 with immune checkpoint inhibition. And it shows the, the significant improvement in survival of mice upon uh, co-therapy of these two agents. And lastly, some new work has flipped the, the coin essentially. And instead of looking at and trying to identify drugs that um, selectively interact with GPER and not ER-alpha, we're now looking at drugs that uh, or compounds that can selectively interact with ER alpha and not GPR. We think that the cross activation of some of the drugs, for instance, used in breast cancer may actually lead to resistance over time through activation of GPR. So we've identified compounds such as AB1 that are highly selective for estrogen receptor versus GPER and made antagonists that uh, cause degradation of ER alpha, but have no cross activation of GPER. So what's shown here is how we've expanded the, the pharmacological repertoire of compounds targeting these receptors. We have GPER selective compounds, agonists such as G1, antagonists such as G, uh, G15 and G36. And what we're calling SLRP, selective ligands for estrogen receptor proteins that target ER alpha, but don't bind to GPER. And those are in the early stages of development and research still. So just to summarize then I want to show you and, and remind you sort of of some of the timeline that has been involved in our studies. Uh, the receptor was originally cloned by others in the late 90s. An initial study in 2000 suggested a role with, uh, in terms of estrogen action. And our first publication and first uh, uh, description of some of the roles of GPR was in 2005. And all these other studies, the radio imaging I showed you, the effects in diabetes, uh, fibrotic diseases, I didn't show you immune function, uh, cardiovascular effects, um, multiple sclerosis, and, and many others have all taken uh, place over a prolonged period of time, well over a decade, but have finally led to, uh, of course, the phase one trials uh, that Dr. Mooney talked about, 
and movement in terms of developing uh, GPR agonists for uh, metabolic diseases. So this work uh, clearly involves the contributions of an enormous number of people. This is a co-author uh, network generated by the Vivo system here at UNM. So it shows some of the uh, major collaborators over the years through our publications. Um, and also I've got pictures here of students, faculty collaborators, and um, last but certainly not least, uh, Lisa Kudula, Jovan Heuser, Greg Banninger at Rainforest Innovations, and, and I can't not mention Henry Coleman uh, from CoSuit Intellectual Properties, who's uh, done and executed and battled the patent office for all these patents over time. And so just to leave you, um, I'll leave you with this cartoon, which is what we don't want to happen with any of the drugs we discover. Thank you. And thank you again for this award.